All righty, chemistry 3101. Here we are, chapter six already. We're going to talk about chemical reactivity and mechanisms in this class. And as I was telling the class before I started recording this morning, I said, you know, so far we've talked a lot about general chemistry, but it was always general chemistry one discussing topics like formal charge and molar mass and intermolecular forces. But if you've wondered, you know, when are you going to talk about things like Gibbs free energy or changes in Gibbs free energy? or changes in entropy, or changes in enthalpy. Well, those, those topics are going to come up in this chapter, all right? So chemical reactivity in mechanisms. And to me, um, you know, kind of the real hardcore organic chemistry um, is, is in the last half, or the second half of this chapter. Once we get to section 6.7, and of course, I'll remind you when we get there, we're really getting into brand new material, things that you would have never seen before. But let's start with something that you have seen before. And I know you've all heard of enthalpy. It's the heat released at constant pressure, right? So if you look at the definition that I have here on the slide, it says enthalpy, which we use delta H for change in enthalpy, or Q, because um, enthalpy is nothing more than heat released at constant pressure. And you might remember that Q is heat, okay? It makes total sense, right? So delta H or Q is the heat energy exchange between the reaction um, and its surroundings. So the system is what we call the reaction sometimes. So you can put a little arrow here, we'll call that system. So our reaction is our system, and then of course the surroundings is everything surrounding it. And the reason why we deal with reactions at constant pressure in organic chemistry is because there are almost no situations that come up. I mean, very, very rarely do we run reactions at constant volume in uh, organic chemistry. We almost always have our reactions open to the environment somehow. Um, and I won't go into too much details about that, but that's what we're concerned about. If you go back to your general chemistry one days, you probably would remember that you talked about reactions at constant volume, like I just mentioned, but we, we don't discuss that at all in this class. All right, so we just keep the definition like that. So delta H, we just make it really simple, and I'm not gonna go through the derivation. We'll say delta H, which is the change in enthalpy, is equal to the heat released or absorbed at constant pressure. So that's what the little subscript P stands for there. All right, let's go back to another topic that everybody loves, which is molecular orbital theory. And this isn't meant to be anything complicated. It's just stating that if you have two electrons that are making a bond, right? You know that whenever you have a bond, there's two electrons in that bond. If we have a really simple molecule like hydrogen, you know that there's two electrons in this bond, right? There's two electrons in there. If you have a molecule of, I don't know, of ethane, let's just say, I'll just exemplify the carbon-carbon bond here, right? We know that there are two electrons in any bond, whether it's a sigma bond or a pi bond, right? And so why do electrons bond? Well, the reason why they um, the orbitals overlap and we form a bond is because they achieve a lower energy state, right? There's gotta be something in it for the electrons, so they achieve a lower energy state. And so it stands to reason that if you form a bond, so that's what's being represented here. You take two electrons in atomic orbitals, they form a bond, right? Both of the electrons go into the bonding MO. If it's lower in energy, well, it stands to reason, okay, and I'm gonna highlight this, that breaking a bond requires the input of energy. So it's nothing more than if you break a bond, you have to put energy in, okay? Energy in to break a bond. Um, and it says here, the electrons must absorb kinetic energy to overcome the stability of the bond, right? They have to have enough kinetic energy applied so that you get enough energy to break the bond. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about bond breaking. Now there's two different ways that bonds can break. They can either break homolytically, and that's what you see here at the top. So homo meaning the same. And if you take a look at this um, diagram here, this mechanism really is what it is. You can see that we have two fish hook arrows. And I told you that I wouldn't really go into the details on fish hooks until chapter 10, but you should be aware that when you see a fish hook arrow, it represents the flow of one electron. And so homolytically means you have a bond between two atoms. Can anybody see my screen at all? Okay. All right, let's keep going then. So we have a homolytic bond cleavage. So that means that each atom is going to take one electron and we end up with a pair of radicals in that case. When we have a heterolytic bond cleavage, that's when both of the electrons from the bond go to one atom. And so what we're gonna focus on in this chapter is gonna be homolytic bond cleavage, okay? So each of the atoms in the bond 
it's going to take one of the electrons and we end up with a pair of radicals. And when we're discussing, you know, how much energy does it take to break a bond homolytically? We call that a bond dissociation energy or a BDE. And that's related directly to the change in enthalpy, right? How much energy are, do we have to put in there to break a bond homolytically? All right. So now that we've covered that, let's take a look at some bond dissociation energy. So these are some BDEs, right? Bond dissociation energies. And you can see that we have all kinds of different bonds here. And then we have not only the amount of energy that it takes to break them um, in terms of kilojoules per mole, but it's also listed in kilocalories per mole. I'm always going to give you any um, bond dissociation energy in kilojoules per mole. That's the preferred unit of chemistry 3101. And I'm sure it's what you saw in your general chemistry class as well. <clears throat> now, one thing I want to point out to you is I'm sure you're all familiar with the H2 molecule. You've seen this Avogadro's number of times in your classes. But if we look at just carbon-hydrogen bonds, you can see that the carbon-hydrogen bond in methane versus the carbon-hydrogen bond in ethane, you can see that they have two different bond dissociation energies. And so because of that, um, sometimes I'll just give you an average bond dissociation energy for a carbon-hydrogen bond because they can vary, um, uh, you know, they can vary to some degree. So that's going to be one thing. And if you look at carbon-carbon bonds, right, the ubiquitous carbon-carbon bond in organic chemistry, of course. Well, if you look at the carbon-carbon bond in ethane versus the carbon-carbon bond in propane versus the carbon-carbon bond in, um, so this would be um, uh, isobutane here. So you see that they all have different bond dissociation energies. And so sometimes I'll give you a specific bond dissociation energy, and other times I'm going to give you a, um, an average, right? So um, I just want to address one thing in just a second, but I'll show you, you know, you can go to a much more exhaustive table of bond dissociation energies. And you can see that we have a whole plethora of bond dissociation energies here. And they also give you the bond lengths, which is kind of interesting. But just one thing that we talked about earlier on in the class that I wanted to highlight for you and just kind of show it to you numerically is if you remember, Remember when we had a carbon-carbon bond? Okay, let's say this takes, you know, 347 <clears throat> kilojoules per mole to break that bond. Well, do you remember when we had a carbon-carbon double bond, was that stronger or weaker if we, as we went from a single to a, a double? <clears throat> yeah, it got stronger, right? Thanks, Katana. And you can see that here as you go from a single to a double right? The bond association energy increases dramatically, right? And then if you go to a triple bond, right, you see that it increases even more. So that's just one thing I wanted to kind of point out to you on here. Um, I'm just going to switch over to a blank document here just for a second, because there's something else I wanted to share with you. And that's calculating the delta H of a reaction. So when we calculate the delta H naught of a reaction, so that means the change in enthalpy for our reaction, it might be heat released, it might be heat absorbed. And remember, in organic chemistry, we're always gonna say that our change in enthalpy is equal to the, to the heat released or absorbed at constant pressure. Well, if you go back to your Gen Chem 1 days, so let me just move this down here. here. If you go back to your, um, let's see here. Uh, let me just move this again. So if I move this down, if you go back to your Chem 1401, so I'll put here chem 1401 slash chem 1411. The formula that you would have used in that class for the change in enthalpy of a reaction, you said the change in enthalpy for your reaction at standard state was equal to the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients multiplied by the change in enthalpy for the formation of the products. So products minus the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients multiplied by the change in enthalpy for the formation of the reactants. So reactants, reactants, okay? We're actually not gonna use this formula at all, okay? We're not gonna use that in this class. And if you're wondering why not, well, the reason why, um, let me explain it to you, is because in Chem 1401, you could look up the heat of formation in a table in the back of your general chemistry textbook for all these different inorganic compounds that we were interested in, okay? But in organic chemistry, there's so many millions of compounds that are possible that we like to use um, averages. Like I said, sometimes I'll give you a specific bond dissociation energy, but oftentimes 
I'll give you just an average. And so what we're going to do for organic chemistry, I'll write it here in red. We'll put here chem 3101, chem 3101 slash chem 3111. So that's organic chemistry one and two is we're going to actually simplify the formula to some degree. We're going to say the delta H naught for our reaction is going to be equal to the bond dissociation energies of the reactants. So we just look those up in a table. Subtract the bond, bond dissociation energies of the products. Okay, so I want to address two things. The first thing is this. If you go back to general chemistry one, every formula that you ever looked at was always products minus reactants, products minus reactants. Whether it was delta H, delta S, delta G, didn't matter what it was, it was always products minus reactants. This formula, the one that I've written down here, this is the only formula that you'll ever see in chemistry that is reactants minus products, okay? Very specific that this one is reactants minus products. And why would that be, okay? Let's think about it. It's because you're taking the bond association energies of the reactants. Well, when you're looking at the bond association energies, you're going to read them as positive values, right? So if you go back to those tables, every value is positive. Why? Because it takes energy to break a bond. That was like the first thing we spoke about this morning. So that's going to be a positive value, right? And then why are you subtracting here, right? Because when you form bonds in your products, energy is always released. So we have a positive sign for our reactants when we break the bonds and then when we release energy when you form the products that's why we put a negative sign here so that's why we use this formula so a positive bond association energy of our reactants or you could just say the bond association and energy of your reactants subtract the bond association energies of your products nothing more than that i mean i've even seen students write a simplified uh, form of it like this they'll say delta h naught of the reaction is equal to bonds broken, bonds broken, minus bonds formed. That's it, man. That's all there is to it. Okay, so that will get you anywhere you need to go. So if you need any values on your quiz for quiz six, I'm going to give you those values. Okay, you don't have to memorize a bunch of bond association energies. That's not the point of our class whatsoever. But give me a thumbs up if you're with me on that idea. Okay, this is what we're going to use in our class. Okay, yeah, so you, you're going to want to know that formula for the quiz. And again, if you need to do a calculation, I guess you can bring a calculator. I mean, I think you should be able to take 200 and subtract, you know, 175 from it or something. But anyhow, you can bring a calculator. It's not that big a deal for that quiz, but it should be a non-programmable um, calculator. Anyhow, let's go back to our notes here. Uh, so where was I? Somewhere around here talking about all these bond association energies. And that brings me to my next point, right? You guys would remember looking at the sign of delta H, right? Sometimes delta H is positive, oops, and sometimes it's negative. When we have um, the sign being negative, we call that an exothermic reaction. So we'll put here delta H is equal to negative. <laughs> and when we have our delta H being positive, so delta H um, being positive, we call that an endothermic reaction. Now, if we look at these heats of reaction, okay, which is the change in enthalpy, the de definition of the exothermic reaction, it says the energy released by the bonds form exceeds the energy for the bonds broken. So in other words, our products are going to be more stable than our reactants. So if we look at a reaction coordinate diagram, and Mr. Dion's not an artist here, but if this is our reaction coordinate, and if this is enthalpy over here, you have, you know, your starting material, your reactants, and then your products are going to be more stable. And that's a picture that I have on the next slide as well. But in an endothermic reaction, it's the opposite, right? The products are going to be less stable. And so our delta H is going to be a positive number. So if this is our reaction coordinate, right, we're going to do something like this. Okay, products are less stable than the reactants. Now, if you don't like my diagram, well, you can look at this uh, page here. And you can see it's much prettier here. So here's our reaction coordinate. So reaction coordinate, if you've never figured out what that means, it just means the progress of the reaction, right? So this is the beginning of time. This is the end of time of the reaction. Who knows how long it is? Maybe it's a minute. Maybe it's a second. Maybe it's a day. Maybe it's a month. Doesn't matter, right? So exothermic versus endothermic. Let's just take a look at exothermic, and then we'll kind of draw the same conclusions from endothermic, just the same but opposite, right? So it says here, um, when you have an exothermic reaction, the one on the left, 
the products are lower in energy. Energy is released as heat, good, right? Exo, leaving, right? Energy is leaving, okay? The potential energy in the bonds is converted to kinetic energy, right? So it's gonna cause the motion of molecules. And our delta H is negative. Temperature of surroundings increases. Again, exotherm, right? You think le heat leaving, right? So I think that usually makes sense to people. But if we go back to our whole um, delta H naught of our reaction as being the delta H of our products minus the delta H of our reactants, and this is just a simplified version of the Gen Chem, Gen Chem 1 formula that I showed you that we won't actually use. Now, after I told you I wasn't going to use or we're not going to use it, I'm just going to use it for a demonstration here. So if you look, if this is the scale here, the enthalpy scale, you can see the products are at a lower number than the starting material. So if I take a small number and I subtract a large number, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a negative number. Give me a thumbs up if that makes some rational sense to you. Right. It doesn't matter what the number is. The first one could be one. The second one could be two. It could be 100. It doesn't matter. You just get a negative number. OK, so if you understood that, um, then the, it's just the opposite for um, an endothermic reaction. The only thing that's really kind of different here is the energy is consumed. So you take the kinetic energy of motion and you convert it into potential energy that's stored in bonds when we have an endothermic reaction. So there you go. Exothermic and endothermic with all that in mind, we're going to take a look at a problem here. It says using the data in table 6.1, um, predict the sign and magnitude of del de delta H naught for the following reaction and determine whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. So what we're trying to do here is evaluate delta H naught for this reaction. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the bonds that are broken and then the bonds that are formed. Now, you probably recognize this molecule here. Could anybody identify this molecule? And it's not a trick question. You know by now how much I detest the trick question. Yeah, thanks, Katana. It's a, it's a molecule of propane, right? So we have a molecule of propane, then we have bromine, then we have two bromopropane and HBr. Well, one thing that's kind of lacking here is they didn't really exemplify the bonds very well. But you can see that we're breaking this carbon-hydrogen bond, aren't we? Right, this bond is being broken. And you can also see that if we draw our bromine molecule like this, we're also breaking this bond, the bond between the two bromine atoms. So those are gonna be our bonds broken. So we could go back to the table and see if we can find those bonds. So let me put here, um, delta H naught for this reaction is gonna be equal to um, bond association energy, BDE of reactants. Reactants minus bond dissociation energies of products, right? There we go. So let's see if we can find the reactants. So we'll find, see if we can find that carbon hydrogen bond and propane. Just bear with me as I rifle back to the table. I didn't think that I put it in here. So there's a more exhaustive table in your textbook. So you're going to have to go to the textbook. So um, in Klein where he has all the values that you need. But I don't even have the value for bromine on here. So um, I think the value for Br2 is, is shown on here. It's 193. And that's the same number that's found in Klein. And then the, the carbon-hydrogen bond in the propane molecule is not shown in here. So again, you have to go to table 6.1. It's in your textbook. But the bond association energy for the carbon-hydrogen bond in the propane is 397. And of course, this is kilojoules per mole. And then we're going to add the bond association energy for the bromine. So 193. I'll put kilojoules per mole at the end. And then we're going to we're going to subtract the bond association energies of the product. So we need this carbon bromine bond. And then we also need the hydrogen bromine bond in HBr. I've gone ahead and looked those up already in the table. So the carbon bromine bond in, in this uh, two bromopropane is 285. And then um, for the HBr, it's 368, so 368. And then all of that, of course, is kilojoules per mole. And so when you punch this spinach into your calculator, you end up with 590. I'll try to color code it here, 590. Um, subtract. Subtract, the next number is uh, 653, 653. And of course, all of that is kilojoules per mole. And so you end up with your delta H naught for your reaction 
is equal to negative 63, <clears throat> excuse me, kilojoules per mole. And there we have it. So would you classify this reaction as being an endothermic reaction or an exothermic reaction? Anybody? Yeah, it's an exothermic reaction, right? Because the sign is negative. So we'll put here delta H not of the reaction is negative. Therefore, reaction is exothermic. Walla, walla, bang, bang. There we go. Not too bad. So that's about what you need to know, or what I would kind of ask you about um, enthalpy. You know, I always put a question like this on the quiz or something, or you have to apply some bond dissociation energies. Again, you can't bring table 6.1 into the quiz. Hear ye, hear ye, okay? If you need a value, it'll be on the quiz for you, okay? It's gonna be in the question. Uh, so you'll just have to apply the mathematics to it. All right, so now that we've covered that, hey, do you guys remember this? that delta H is not the ultimate deciding factor as to whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. Yeah, so if you have something with a negative delta H, right, like heat is being released like a fire, you think, well, come on, the fire keeps burning, it's spontaneous. Yeah, but there are, there are exothermic reactions that are non-spontaneous, and there are endothermic reactions that are spontaneous. Why? Because the ultimate deciding factor as to whether a reaction is spontaneous or not is actually entropy. Right. Entropy. And if you're sitting there going, well, I thought it was Gibbs free energy. That's what I was taught. It was Gibbs free energy. Well, if you remember, I mean, we're going to get to this in a few minutes. The Gibbs free energy is nothing more than a repackaged form of entropy of, um, of the system and the surroundings combined. So we're going to take a look at that later on. So we, I just kind of covered that both endothermic and exothermic reactions can occur spontaneously. We're much more used to this in our everyday lives. Right, exothermic reactions being spontaneous, endothermic spontaneous, uh, we don't think of the, that a whole lot in our everyday lives. But anyhow, now it says here in the second bullet point that enthalpy and entropy have to both be considered when we're predicting whether a reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. And again, if you're, if you're ahead of me, which I'm sure some of you are, if you're thinking, well, isn't that Gibbs free energy? Yes, we're going to get there in a little bit. So recall that entropy can be described as disorder, randomness, right? or freedom, right? Um, you know, if you think about entropy increasing, right? This is a spontaneous thing, why? Because if you think about, you know, uh, your, your kitchen, you know, you can organize your kitchen, it takes a lot of energy to do that, but it takes no energy for it to become disorganized, right? It just happens naturally. So a process that involves an increase in entropy is said to be spontaneous, and our change in entropy, or our delta S, is gonna be a positive number. And so you want to keep this in mind here. So spontaneous delta S is positive. Now, in um, general chemistry, you would have gone into tables of uh, entropy values and you would have calculated delta S using delta S is equal to the, the S of the products minus the reactants, right? In this class, we don't really do that. I don't think there's any questions in the book even about that. In organic chemistry, we actually simplify it by quite a bit. And we look at two factors that contribute to entropy. Okay, two major things that contribute to entropy in this class in organic chemistry. You ready? Here they are. If you have, um, when there's more than uh, more moles of product than reactant, we consider delta S to be positive, right? So delta S is equal to positive. You're going from one thing, and I shouldn't, right? They always say a good scientist would never use the word stuff or things. But anyhow, you go from one entity, so from one mole, of a reactant, and if you break the bond and you have two moles, well, obviously you can organize two things. There, I did it again. You can obviously organize two molecules more ways that you can organize one molecule, right? So you can see that delta S is uh, positive, right? Because we're becoming more disordered. And the second thing, dang it, I gotta stop using that word. The second situation is if you have a molecule that's cyclic and you break that, if you um, break a bond and it becomes acyclic, well, then it has more freedom of movement. And so in that case, too, delta S would be a positive number. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on these two concepts. This is about as deep as we go in delta S in organic chemistry. Okay, well, let's test our knowledge on that with a little question here. This is question 6.3 from the textbook. Pretty straight. I don't like to use the word straightforward. Who knows? It might be straightforward for some, maybe not for others. Let's take a look anyway. It says for each of the following processes, predict whether the sign of delta S um, is going to be positive or negative. So is there going to be an increase in, in entropy 
or a decrease in entropy. Let's take a look at the first one. This is actually a reaction that's covered in uh, organic chemistry too. This is called the Diels-Alder reaction. What you'll find in organic chemistry too is that there are a plethora of reactions in organic chemistry that are named after scientists. So this one is called the Diels-Alder reaction. It's got a really cool mechanism that I'm not gonna get into, but you can see we're taking two moles of reactants and we're making one mole of product. And thus, would this be a positive delta S or a negative delta S? Is entropy? Yes, thank you, Sean. Excellent, yes. So delta S is gonna be a negative number. What about the next one? I'm taking this molecule here. This is called 2-bromo-2-methylpropane uh, two two or terp-butyl bromide. Either one is acceptable by IUPAC. So you're taking that molecule and you're breaking it apart into a carbocation, what we call a carbocation, and a bromide ion. What about the, the sign of delta S for this one? But oh, my students are way ahead of me. Yeah, in this one, the sign of delta S is gonna be positive. So delta S is equal to positive. If you're thinking, man, I hope he makes the whole quiz about that. Well, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to do that, but I'll probably ask a question on, on one of these topics here. So let's move on from there and let's move uh, into the, the area of Gibbs free energy. Willard Gibbs, an American scientist, um, I think that, uh, and I probably, if you had me as an instructor before, you probably heard me say this, but uh, even Albert, Albert Einstein said that Gibbs was a genius. He said, this guy's so, so smart, he makes me, he intimidates me, you know? So if, uh, if Einstein thinks you're cool and thinks you're smart, you must be pretty bright. Anyhow, so um, now this is going back to Gen Chem 1, okay? When you talked about the spontaneity of a reaction, you would have said, well, the spontaneity of a reaction or a process depends on the total entropy. And total entropy, what does that comprise? Well, it comp comprises the system, so that's your reaction, and then the surroundings, that's the environment directly around the reaction flask or rea your reaction mixture. So you have to take both of those into account to determine whether a reaction is gonna be spontaneous or not. Now, the delta S for the, of the system, that one is relatively straightforward because you can just go to the back of a general chemistry one textbook and you would look up the values from a table and you would say delta S is equal to the S of the products minus the S of the reactants, et cetera, et cetera. However, the delta S of the surroundings. Now, if I was in front of you and could act this out, I'd be kind of silly about this. But I mean, you think about it. If you have a reaction flask, so let's just imagine. Come on. 10. There we go. So let's just imagine you have a flask here. All right. Imagine Sean is doing a reaction in the lab. You know, he's got some kind of nitrogen line. He's going really fancy here. I, I'm making it too complicated. I don't know, Sean. Okay. So let's just imagine Sean has some kind of reaction going. Well, what's he going to do if he's trying to measure the delta S of the surroundings? Okay. There's no magic probe that he could put around here. This is some kind of instrument that he has hooked up to some kind of meter or something. That's impossible. You cannot do this. You know what? We'll put a big X over that. There's no way to do that. Okay, that's impossible. You can't measure the change in entropy of every molecule. Like how fast is this moving now, you know, around the flash? So what do you do? Well, luckily we have a workaround for that. And this is a formula that we don't go into the details of where it comes from, thank God. Okay, uh, we don't have that kind of time. But this is one of the really cool formulas because it says the delta S of the surroundings, which is impossible to measure, is equal to the delta H or the negative of the delta H of the system over temperature. Now, where would we get the delta H of the system? Well, you could measure it using bond dissociation energies or you could use the Gen Chem 1 formula. We just practiced that, right? So this is something we know how to calculate and we can definitely measure temperature with the thermometer so again, this is a beautiful formula. Now you can define the total entropy, which is the ultimate governing factor as to whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. Check this out. You define the whole damn thing, pardon my language, <clears throat> by the system, okay? So this is, I, and if you're not really a chemistry aficionado, and I know you probably all are at this point, right? You're just loving the class so much. This is one of the greatest formulas ever, right? Because everything is defined in terms of the system. Now, if you haven't taken Gen Chem 1 in a while, and if you're like, what the is that formula? Did I learn that? I've seen that. Well, the reason why you might not remember this formula is because if you take the whole thing and you multiply it by negative T, you end up with this. So you end up with negative T times the change 
uh, the total change in entropy is equal to the delta H of the system minus T delta the S of the system. And so the negative T times delta S, that's delta G, right? And so since it's negative T, that's why we said when a process is spontaneous, right, the delta S is positive. Well, since delta G is taking that value and multiplying it by a negative number, the signs flip, okay? So if you have a negative delta G value, okay, that means the reaction is spontaneous. And if you have a positive delta G value, that means the reaction is non-spontaneous. That's, that's the whole thing right there. All right. So again, the beauty of this formula that's at the bottom down here, one of the greatest formulas ever, um, is that everything is uh, defined in terms of the system, right? Delta H is the change in entropy of the surroundings, right? But we're defining it, defining it as um, by the change in enthalpy of the system. So it's a really beautiful, beautiful thing. So just to rehash, okay? When delta G is negative, that's spontaneous. And when delta G is positive, it is non-spontaneous. Okay, so you want to remember that um, moving forward. So um, if you're wondering, well, what does a reaction coordinate diagram look like for free energy? Well, now well, all we've done is taken a reaction coordinate diagram and we've replaced enthalpy with free energy, okay? And so if you have a negative delta G, we call that an exergonic process. And if you have a positive delta G, we call that an endergonic process. So notice that in this energy diagram, it's free energy, again, plotted rather than enthalpy. Now, if you go back again, and I know I keep rifling back to Gen Chem 1, but, but I was going to say trust me, but I stopped myself. Um, but I have taught this class many, many, many times. And so if you're wondering, well, when did I calculate delta G and how did I do it? In, in Gen Chem 1, what you would have done is you would have said delta G naught of your reaction is equal to the sum of the changes in Gibbs free energy um, for the formation of your products. Products, I'm going to run out of space here. Minus the sum eh, of the change of um, Gibbs free energy of formation of your products. Okay. So if it's, if it's, um, did I put products when I meant reactants? Jeepers, Mr. Dion. Okay. So it's products minus reactants. Sorry about that. Okay. So if we think about this, if we take a small number and we subtract a big number, what do we get? We get a negative number. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me on that. Small. All right, that's what's being shown here on this graph is a small number minus a large number and then you get a negative number cool and then you can see that if we have an um, endergonic process it's the opposite right? you have a big number subtract a small number you get a positive number there you go so that's an endergonic or non-spontaneous process and there you have it my friends that's a little bit of delta h a little bit of delta s and a little bit of delta g so any questions about that before we move on? And of course, we're going to, those concepts are going to come up a little bit more later on. Okay. So now that we've got that down, we're going to, so again, those topics do come up in general chemistry too, but honestly, they come up more in general chemistry one, don't they? Right. They're even more, right. In general chemistry two, you spend more time on this kind of stuff. Equilibria. Okay. You guys remember big K and little K? So just to rehash in case you've forgotten. Um, big K, that's equilibrium constant, equilibrium constant, the big K. And Eric, what's the little K stand for, or anybody? What's the little K? Anybody remember that one? Okay. That's special K, Mr. Dion. That's the serial. No, no, it's not. Does anybody remember? So big K was equilibrium constant, and little K was, okay, if you don't remember, that was rate constant. So rate constant. Those are the two Ks that you would have learned. And th again, that would be general chemistry too. So I know that some of you just took it last semester. You might be a little rusty on those things. But you would have spent an entire, if you took it with me, and I know that like Katana was in my class and Eric was in my class, um, we spent the whole chapter, we spent multiple chapters, as a matter of fact, talking about big K, didn't we, right? Equilibrium constant. And then the very first chapter that we did in Gen Chem 2 was talking about rate constants. So what we're going to start with now is equilibria. So we're going to start by talking about big K, right? And you have to say it like that, big K, right? Anyhow, so if we consider an exergonic process, like what's shown here in this graph, okay? We have our Gibbs free energy in our y-axis, reaction coordinate on the x. Okay, it says if you have a negative delta G for your reaction, 
That means that it's a spontaneous process. Okay, great. Does that mean that every molecule of A and B are going to be converted into C and D? Well, hopefully you can tell that, that no, it's not going to happen. Why? Because you can tell that this double arrow here, what does that double arrow stand for? Anybody know? It's not resonance, is it? What kind of arrow is that? Heck yeah, that's an equilibrium arrow. Equilibrium arrow. Okay, it's got nothing to do with resonance whatsoever. So um, uh, just because we have a negative delta G doesn't mean that everything is going to be converted to products. No, because we can reach an equilibrium. It says a spontaneous process means there's going to be more products than reactants, but it doesn't mean that everything necessarily is going to be converted into products. Now, there is a relationship between the magnitude of delta G or negative delta G and the amount of products, right, versus reactants, right? The more negative our delta G is, yeah, the more products we're going to have, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to be converted into products. And if you're sitting there going, well, why would that be? I thought the spontaneous reaction goes, everything's in product. No. Then if you're wondering, well, why would that be? Here's the answer, okay? Why do some reactants still remain at equilibrium? So look, we're starting here, okay? We'll start here. All we have is A and B, okay? We have no C and D. And then the reaction starts progressing and you're forming more C and D over time, more C and D over time, more C and D over time. Well, what you're seeing here is that we have some free energy plotted on the y-axis and eventually we reach a value where we have the minimum of delta G, right? The lowest point of delta G. This is when the reaction is most spontaneous, okay? And at that point, it just so happens that we're at equilibrium and we have some A and B, we have mostly C and D, right? We're mostly to this side. However, everything hasn't been com converted into products. And why would that happen? It's because as you start to form more, more products, the products, the C and D, they can start colliding with each other and start reforming A and B. And when you reach that negative, or sorry, that negative, when you reach that minimum value of delta G, that's when the rate of the forward and the reverse reaction are going to be equal to each other. Okay, and that again is when we reach equilibrium and you can measure the K for that. You can say that K equilibrium is equal to the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. All right, like that. So that's something that you would have covered. Um, and so this where equilibrium is reached, right? This is a very specific concentration of products and reactants. All right. So. The formula when we have that reaction, so this is the reaction that was on the previous slide, A plus B is in equilibrium with C plus D. It says an equilibrium constant is used to show the degree to which the reaction is product or reactant favored. So if products are in the numerator, you can imagine that if K equilibrium is a big number, then we end up with, or we, we would say we have mostly products. If K equilibrium is a small number, that would mean our denominator is larger and it's mostly reactants. And then, of course, there's a relationship here between the ln of K equilibrium and delta G. So if our K equilibrium is a big number, then we end up with a negative, right? We get a positive for the ln of the KEQ, and we end up with a negative delta G. However, if um, KEQ is a really small number, right, then we get a negative for this value in here. Negative times a negative gives you a positive. I'm not going to go over all the math of that right now. I just taught it last semester, so I'm a little, um, there's, there's just no point, right? Um, but anyhow, so it says K equilibrium, equilibrium constant, delta G, delta H, delta S. These are all what kind of term? These are all thermodynamic terms. Everything that we're discussing here, this is just thermodynamics. It's got nothing to do. Look deep into my eyes. It has nothing to do with how fast the reaction is going. Right? The classic example is, is a diamond, right? If you take carbon in the diamond form, I mean and it's being converted to carbon in the graphite form, right? That reaction has a delta G, which is negative. Okay? It's a spontaneous process. And so diamonds, uh, if you have diamonds, you're like, well, I got a diamond in my watch or something. Well, it's being converted into dust. It's being converted into worthless, gra or essentially worthless graphite, you know, over time because it's got a negative delta G. So you're like, oh, darn, maybe I should just give my diamonds away or something. No, because... The delta G is negative, yeah, but it's very small. And so even though it's a spontaneous reaction, it takes a long time. So again, there's no connection between what I have in the yellow highlighter and how fast or how slow the reaction is. That, when we get into rate, 
rate, that's when we look at little k. That's when we discuss things like concentration, activation energy, right? Stuff like that. So let's finish up equilibria by asking ourselves a couple of questions here. Um, oh, actually, the question is not for a couple more slides. Okay, so let's go over here. This slide, you know, I, I say this all the time, don't I? Because sometimes my students will ask me, Mr. Dion, do you have a summary? This is kind of a summary of the whole equilibria thing. And again, you know that the connection between Gibbs free energy and equilibrium constant, so ln KEQ. Anyhow, um, it says here if delta G is negative, it's um, mostly products and KEQ is going to be a big number. If delta G is positive, it's mostly reactants and KEQ is a small number. Um, in order for a reaction to be something that you can use, you must have a negative delta G, otherwise you've got mostly reactants. So that means your um, K equilibrium has got to be greater than one, usually greater than a thousand is what I would think. Anyhow, a little bit of difference. This is really not beyond the scope of our course, um, but this thing here, this whole point, I'm going to write here, C next slide. What is the next slide? What table is it? It's table 6.2. So C, next slide, table 6.2. And it's more of an FYI thing. And then down here at the bottom, I just threw in the laws of thermodynamics so you wouldn't forget them. So uh, first one is the law of conservation of energy. You can't create and destroy energy. Um, if you have a spontaneous reaction, entropy is increasing. That's kind of the second law. And when delta S, delta S, excuse me, the change in uh, entropy is zero at um, absolute zero. So you have a perfect crystal, which doesn't exist anyway. But uh, yeah, so this one is, I'd say this table is more of an FYI. I used to teach organic chemistry for chemistry majors, and I would go into this in more detail with them. But the take home message for, the, for this, and you're gonna have to take my word for it really, is that you can see that you only change by about six, you know, kilojoules per mole at a time here. And you go from, you know, 50% all the way up to 100%, just, you know, a change in 17 kilojoules per mole. And if I was you, if I was a student, I'd be sitting there going, well, I don't know, is that big or is that small? The idea is that it's not a huge change. There's not a huge difference. And you can have dramatic changes. And, you know, look, even going from zero to negative 11, you go to 99% yield. So that's pretty dang good, right? Did I say uh, going from zero to negative 11, you go from a 50% yield to a 99% yield? Anyhow, I've never quizzed a student on this table. It's more like an FYI kind of thing. Okay, so let's try a question that deals with equilibrium. And if you were just, you know, sitting there over the last 20 minutes and going, this isn't really crystallizing in my mind. But once we look at this question and you see what kind of things I would ask you, I bet you it will crystallize in your mind. So let's see here. It says in each of the following cases, use the data given to determine whether a reaction favors reactants. Okay, is it going to be mostly reactants or is it going to be mostly products? So if you have a pot, so for A, if you have a positive delta G, what's it going to be mostly reactants or products? Lay it on me. Thanks, Kiana. Perfect. Yeah, it's going to be mostly reactants. It's, yeah, absolutely. Um, what if you've got a K equilibrium that's 0.5? So it's less than one. If it's less than one, right, it's a small number, it's going to be mostly reactants in that case. So remember that KEQ is equal to products over reactants, right? So if, if we just pull some numbers out of the air that will give us um, 0.5, we would put one over two. So that means you have mostly reactants, right, to equal, to equal 0 0.5. Does that make sense now? Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, cool. All right, reactants. Uh, let's see with the next one. C. Uh, it says you've got a reaction carried out at 298 Kelvin. You've got a delta H, which is positive 33 kilojoules per mole, and a delta S that's 150 kilojoules per mole. Well, you notice first thing is that kilojoules and joules don't jive. Okay, they don't match each other. So I'm just going to convert this into joules. So we'll call it 33,000 joules per mole something like that so let's try c we'll plug some numbers in here so we've got delta g is equal to delta h minus t delta s so our delta h is going to be what 33,000 joules per mole and then um, we're going to subtract 
by Dylan here. Sorry, I'm just making sure I didn't make a mistake. In my math, oh, I'm going to grab, I don't even have a calculator. I'll just use my phone, which is against the rules. But anyhow, let's see here. So then I have, what's my T is 298, <clears throat> excuse me, Kelvin, times my S, which is 150 joules per mole times Kelvin. So let's see here, we've got 298 times 150. So that gives us 33,000 joules per mole. Subtract 44,700. And you can see that, of course, Kelvin cancels out here. Um, joules per mole. So we get 33,000. Subtract 44,700. <clears throat> And we get negative 11,000, oops, 11,700 joules per mole, which is equal to negative 11.7 kilojoules per mole. So since we have a negative number, what does that mean? Is it going to be mostly reactants or products? It's going to be mostly products, right? So we'll put here products. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's try D. D says you've got an exothermic reaction. So if it's exothermic, it means your delta H is negative with a positive value of delta S. So if you have delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, we have a negative number, and then we're going to subtract T delta S. So T is always a positive number, and then our delta S is a positive number like that. So if you take a negative and you subtract a positive, what do you get 100% of the time? Take a negative and you subtract something positive from it. What do you always get? No exceptions. Anybody? Yeah, no. If you take a negative number, if you take negative two and you subtract a positive number, you subtract three, you get negative five. Right, so you get a negative number. And so that's going to be mostly products. All right, and the last one, E, you have an endothermic reaction. So now your delta H is positive. And a negative value for delta S. So we have delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So we have a positive number, subtract a negative value for delta S. So we have a positive for our temperature, and then we have a negative for our S. So that means you've got a positive, subtract a um, negative. So if you take something positive and you subtract a negative from it, what do you get? You always get something positive. And therefore, it's going to favor the reactants. Reactants. Bada boom, bada bing. There we have it. A little bit of material about equilibria. Any, any questions about those problems? Make sure you know the formula. I'm not going to give this formula to you. Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. you got to know that formula off by heart. All right. Well, there we go. So that brings us to the section on kinetics. I think we'll take a short break before we get into the sections on kinetics. But remember that uh, just by way of an introduction, this is where we get into little k, okay? Not little k, little k like that. So we talk, we're going to talk about the rate constant. And remember that just because the sign of delta G is negative, it doesn't tell us how fast the products are going to be formed. Um, so that's what this whole chapter is, or whole, this whole section is going to be about. That Yes, some spontaneous reactions are fast, some are slow. And we're going to get into the reasons as to why some are fast and some are slow. That sounds like a Dr. Seuss book, doesn't it? <laughs>